Welcome to Lecture 27 of BIB 102 New Testament Survey. Today's lecture is going to be completing the book of 1 Peter and going through the book of 1 John. Picking back up where we left off in the previous lecture, letter C, Peter admonishes his readers in light of the certainty and imminence of the Lord's return. Now the word imminence just means that the Lord could return at any moment. In this chapter, he gives us two great things about the imminency of the Lord's return. Number one, he explains in the last days that those would question the Lord's return. Peter proclaimed in those last days, which basically the last days are from the time when the Lord ascended into heaven until now, that there would come those who would mock the word of God and walk after their own lusts and question if the Lord would ever return even in the first place. And then secondly, Peter clarifies that the Lord will return suddenly and when they least expect it. He comforts his audience and tells them to not give up courage because the Lord's time is relative. He even quotes Psalm 90 verse 4 in that a thousand years is just like a day to the Lord. So the Lord will return, but when he is ready. In fact, he says that the Lord's return will be like a thief in the night. When you least expect it, he will come for his believers and take us to a place of safety. Now that we completed 2 Peter, let's move on to the next book that appears in your typical order of the New Testament, the book of 1 John. Concerning the introductory material, letter A, this book was written by John the Apostle. Now, although John the Apostle does not directly identify himself as the author in this book, it has been the traditionally held view that he wrote it for the last 2,000 years. Now, this was the Apostle who was considered the best friend of Jesus. And then letter B, this book was written sometime between AD 85 to AD 90. And we believe that John wrote this while living in the city of Ephesus. And then letter C, this book was written to an unknown group. While 1 John does not label the people to whom this epistle was written, it is generally attested that this epistle was written to a group of churches in Ephesus. This is because this is the place where he is traditionally held as one of the pastors of the churches in Ephesus. So theologians believe that it was written to those individuals he was ministering to. Now let's look at the purpose and importance of the book of 1 John. Why did God inspire this epistle to be penned by John? Well, it was written for four primary reasons. The first was to enhance its reader's joy. Directly stated in 1 John 1, 4, he says he wrote this so his, joys, his reader's joy would be fulfilled greatly. And the letter B, it was written to guard its readers from sin to help us be delivered and protected from sin. And then letter C, it was written to help its reader have assurance of salvation. This book, more than any book in the New Testament, is a book to go to if you ever have any doubts or you need any assurance of your salvation. And then fourthly and lastly, it was written to warn its reader against false doctrine. Now let's look at the major teachings in the book of 1 John. The first thing that John addresses is that he contrasts light, which is symbolized by righteousness, with darkness, which is symbolic of sin. He gives us three principles concerning this principle and analogy of light and darkness. Number one, he declares that a sign of fellowship with Christ is walking in the light. Since God is light, righteous, then a true sign of fellowship with Christ is walking in the light, walking in righteousness. However, he declares that anyone who says they are fellowshipping with Jesus, but walking in darkness, walking in sin, is really just a fake and a liar. Then secondly, he explains that sin must be acknowledged and confessed. He says that one who confesses his sins will receive forgiveness for those sins from the one who is faithful and righteous. Now the Greek word confess here, which is homologeo, means to be of the same mind. When we confess our sins, we are basically telling God that we view them, our sins, the same way he does, as evil. 
Then number three, he clarifies that obedience is the byproduct of a true believer. John here proclaims that the litmus test for determining if we truly know Jesus is whether or not we are obedient to him. He is not stressing sinless, but obedient. And then letter B, John discusses the proper recipients of a believer's love. He explains this in two ways. Firstly, he says the believer is commanded to love the brethren. John declares that this commandment originated with Jesus and that observance of this commandment is a sign of a true believer. And then secondly, the believer is warned to not love the world. John says we should not love the world because it is full of sin and full of those against Christ. It should be noted that John is not saying to hate those in the world. He is talking about all the evil the world represents and all the evil the world is full of. And then letter C. John presents evidence of salvation. Number one, he declares that children of God demonstrate a changed life. While John explains that a believer will still sin after salvation, he also cautions that true believers will not continue living in sin. If one is the same after salvation than he or she was before salvation, then John declares that he or she is not a true believer at all. And then secondly, he declares that children of God demonstrate love for other believers. Not only is a changed life evidence of one's salvation, his love toward other believers is evidence as well. The awesome byproduct of this pure, unconditional love toward other believers is a vibrant prayer life by receiving what we ask of God because we keep His commandments and do what pleases God, which is having love for one another. And then lastly, letter D, John presents the privileges of being a child of God. At the end of this epistle, he gives us five great privileges that you and I have by being children of God. The first is that we will overcome the world. The first privilege of being a child of God is overcoming power. Although the world is out to get us for our belief in Jesus, the Holy Spirit explains to John's readers that they need not be fearful of those evil forces. Why? Because their faith in Christ is that which will give them victory. And then secondly, we have witness to the truth. The second privilege of being a child of God is that our salvation is a testimony to the truths of God's Word. Not only are we to be a witness of Jesus, we are a witness of Jesus. What a both awesome and humbling honor to be a witness and live as a witness. Then number three, we have assurance of salvation. The third privilege of being a child of God is the security with which our salvation has in Jesus Christ. This is one of the reasons John was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write this epistle, to give assurance of salvation to all its readers. And then number four, he says that we can intercede for other believers. So the fourth privilege of being a child of God is that we have been bestowed the awesome ability to intercede for other believers. John teaches that if we see a brother or sister sin, we can even pray to God and give them life-changing help. And then fifthly and lastly, we are protected by Jesus. The final privilege of being a child of God presented in this epistle is being guarded by God himself. This protection is not just from the evil one, Lucifer, the devil, Satan, but it is also from sin itself. Well, that brings us to the end of Lecture 27. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions or you need anything, please do not hesitate to contact me.